Okay, Libby. So you sadly had to retire from the saddle, but then Sky TV came calling. Was that the next? Was that in the right chronological order? Uh, yes, there was a few bits and pieces in between there. I had done quite a bit of a mode, like um, speaking, public address and public speaking whilst I was riding. Um, after the fall, I started working for the South Australian Sports Show. Um, went in there for an interview and they offered me a role as their uh, sport presenter. So I started doing that and got a handle of how to prepare for um, a shift on camera. And I was doing all my own research across all sports. So it wasn't just the horse racing, which I'm obviously very familiar and comfortable with. But the hardest part of that job actually was learning how to pronounce ridiculous soccer player names. So that was, that was the tricky part of that. Then I started working for a company called G1X and they would fly me out to Melbourne to sit on their show uh, once a week. And that was great. I got to work with some really great guys there. Uh, they taught me a hell of a lot as well. And then I got a call from Sky Racing and that was, it was honestly a dream come through true at the time. I was ecstatic. And how, how long did that last? Um, I think nearly five years. I was so there for a while. Um, and I've also got Jockey's Manager. Is that I, so? I oh yeah, I also managed um, a friend of mine in South Australia. Um, helped her out for a bit when I, in between, obviously after race riding, and I was at home still recovering, but I wanted something to do, so I, I managed a friend of mine, uh, and I also managed a Friedman Brothers racing stable here in um, Sydney for a little while as well. Okay, thank you. Right, so just as a bit of a, a bit more info here. The health of Australia of horse racing in Australia. I mean, there's obviously a lot of tracks. When I was last there, it was about ten years ago. But you know, people still in the betting in the pubs and things like that. So, how is it at the moment? Tricky question because there's always a conjecture that it's uh, struggling, especially in South Australia, in my hometown. I feel like people have been saying South Australian racing is in trouble for at least fifteen years, but it just seems to keep going. My personal opinion is that I am concerned for the welfare of racing and the welfare of um, the perception of racing in the, in the larger community. I feel like racing itself has really sat on its hands for a long time because we race through the great depression. Racing seems to be the one thing that keeps things going and keeps, keeps an industry. The industry just keeps rolling, but Times are changing significantly, especially with social media and the mobilization of younger generations. If you walk down the track, if you walk down the street now, and if you find a random person and ask them what they think of the Melbourne Cup, their first response is always going to be it's cruel and the horses just get whipped because that is the perception in the media. Uh, it's perception within the community and racing, in my opinion, doesn't do enough to battle that. It's just a matter of... Um, really education and because racing we see all these claims come out about all the deaths all the cruelty all the craziness and because it's so ludicrous and so full of bullshit we laugh it off because we know it's not true but the general public don't and they take that on board humans have a, a natural negativity bias anyway and they just hang on to these things and they don't we're not doing enough to combat it because we feel like it's ludicrous yeah, so I've got quite a few Australian friends and I try to ignore their nut to the cup posts in November. Yeah. yeah. Why are we ignoring it? Why aren't we fighting it head on? What? This is a bugbear of mine at Sky too. I was pushing to get human interest and horse interest stories out and not it just be, because Sky's obviously a wagering channel. So it's, it's, it's wagering, it's pushing through. So they couldn't find a position to put these sorts of shows. But we need shows with the people, with the horses and with the love of the horses because- how are you supposed to know anything different? Because all we're doing is pumping out bets and pumping out winners. We're not showing the love behind it that creates it. Like the average person in the industry is not there because of the wage. The wage is often terrible. You can just stay home, get paid by the government and play PlayStation all day. You don't have to get up early. You don't have to have drug tests. You don't have to get breathos. You're going to have a social life that expands outside of the racing industry and you're probably going to get paid more. We're doing it for the love of the horse and it's just not resonating with people outside of the industry you can tell you you tell you're passionate about that definitely and it's a similar similar thing over here so now you're a one of your angles is you're a paid tipster yeah um, was your was your 
the yard that you work for, you know, gambling yard, was is has that always been important in the back of your mind that people are backing these horses and that sort of thing? Um, yes and no. Uh, especially as a rider as well, you you're always acutely aware that there's so many people that are riding on this one performance, this one horse. So it's the owners that have paid up until that point. It's the trainers that have gotten up every day of the week. It's the track rider that adores the horse. It's And then it's the people that put their hard earned money on it. And it's all reliant on this one performance that arguably or not mostly is heavily influenced by luck. So if you can take a little bit of the luck out of it and try to study the form, which is what I'm trying to do as a tipster now and, and help people that are, are putting like our hard earned money on these horses, then I, I feel like I, sh- I should be doing that, especially when you're coming from uh, an angle as an ex rider. If I'm watching something on TV and I'm watching a race, I'm, I might be able to pick up on things that other people can't because they've never ridden a horse. So they can't see that it was hanging or they can't see that it looked a little bit scratchy in the yard or things like that. But would you, when you were a jockey, would you study the form of your horse before you rode it? So you knew it better? No, I was pretty naughty. Uh, also in South Australia, the pool of horses is very small. So we get to know the horses. So when you've been riding there a while, you get to a point where you don't really need to do the form. You know them. Um, you know, this horse likes to lead and you get to learn, importantly, uh, jockey patterns. So you know that that rider's going to get itchy feet at the 600 meters and take off. And if your horse needs a little bit of time to warm into the race, just get on the back and cart up. So it's learning rider patterns and it's learn. you do learn the horses. So the form uh, probably isn't as important in small small racing communities as it is in larger ones. So what's your um your angle? Is it all your form study? Did you get your card marked a bit, or is it a mixture of the two? Mixture of the two. Okay, so you have you have um. So do you have any help with your any particular help with your picks? Any sort of anybody in the background, some sort of form expert that uh, that sort of gives you a bell every morning and. I feel like you get help from the track riders and from like so for people on the ground. So I'm on in it. Uh, the stables every day of the week. So I definitely, I feel like I get help because I hear the whispers and I hear what people are saying about horses, but you also have to balance that too, because there's like that strapper thinks his horse is going to win every time it goes out. So you, you do need to take it with a little bit of a grain of salt and go back and do the form. I so I was looking on your website and you've got, you have like, is it punter of the week or punter of the month or something where somebody, you know, one of your clients sort of comes on, you've got a photograph with them or whatever, they ask you questions and stuff. I mean, see, obviously... Uh, I don't have that. That was an interview of mine, but that is a brilliant idea. And if you don't mind, I'm going to steal it. Okay. <laughs> so that's my, my sloppy research now. Um, so how are the bookmakers at taking bets from your winning clients? I actually don't have a whole lot to do with how much my clients are putting on. I feel like I, I try to keep a little bit of distance with that because responsible gambling and I'm, I'm pushing tips rather than their bets. Um, I, when all my tips go out, they go in and betting units so that punter can designate what their unit is. So one punter's unit might be $100. The other punter's unit might be $10,000. And one guy might be 10 bucks. So I I have had a little bit of feedback that some people have struggled to get bets on on occasion. Uh, but I do think that's across the board. It doesn't matter where you're going from. But it does appear that we are moving markets because I'll put out a tip and, and they do get crunched a little bit. So that's, that's kind of cool. That, that's where I was coming from because we have pro- – at the moment, the UK is in a terrible state with the there's a new gambling regulation coming out, and uh, you know, but a lot of successful punters. If somebody followed your tips and they were winning, they wouldn't be able to get, you know, yeah. pennies on. Um, but they, everybody says, oh, but in Australia, you could back a horse to win. They've got to lay you to win a certain amount of money. So, I was just wondering how much feedback you get from from your punters, sort of, especially the bigger ones, saying that it's great that you're pick, putting these winners up, but I can't actually back them anymore. Is that you? Um, there's also a couple of bookies that seem to be taking me on. So, like, they might not even be paying any attention to what I'm tipping, which is the most likely uh, comment. Like, they've probably got no idea what I'm doing, but they seem to. And I only know this because a few of my um, supporters have got back to me and it's like, oh, they're taking you on again and, then, and this and again and that. So, either that or I'm picking terrible horses and they've got the right market, but often we're winning those ones. So, they're either taking me on or they don't know what I'm doing. And I just think the horse is below what I think it can perform at. 
And how is the there's a, once again in the UK there seems to be a real sort of campaign to make gambling all of a sudden the next to be you know being a drug dealer or something. So how is it looked at in Australia? There is a push for that as well. Um, they're just we're we're very good with responsible gambling messages. Um, there's a lot of laws around responsible gambling messages. Even when I was working at Sky, things like. Uh, you couldn't refer to alcohol because Sky is a, a tipping channel, so you can't combine the two. So there's there's definitely lots of laws around. Um, but yes, I think horse racing and gambling is definitely in the gun. And it goes back to what I was saying earlier about this just this shift in consciousness and the shift in uh, trying to be, I guess, more responsible. Um, but I would argue if you're taking away a person's choice to do something that they want to do, then you're just, it's a, it's another implement of control. You're not teaching people to be responsible. And I, we all know that punters like to sing when they're winning, but how do you get much sort of negative feedback after an inevitable losing run? I probably, I, I probably caught more shit on the losing runs than what I get the positive people, people love to, to smack down on you when you're going terrible, but you know what? It's people's money on the line. So I understand I put myself in this position knowing that I was going to cop a hell of a lot of flack back. Um, and it's, it's water off a duck's back at this point. I understand. I, I do take it personally when I am losing bets. Cause like I said earlier, when I was an apprentice and I was trying to get that championship title, I, I do get tunnel vision. Um, and I do get obsessive about trying to do the right thing. And this is just that new obsession. So when people are going to attack me for a run of losing bets, there's nothing that they can say to me that I haven't said to myself that's worse. Does the the pressure of the fact that you're, you're having a losing run and you know that people are backing you when they're paying to back them, does that make it even harder to try and get a winner? Yeah, sometimes it does. And sometimes I might pick something that's probably a little bit short in the market. Some people are like, oh, I've got to pick, a, pick an evens horse. It's like, honestly, I just need a winner to get the monkey off my back and, and keep things going. But um it's just it's it's a confidence game and it's going well we're at 12 percent at the minute and it's it's 12 percent the average fluctuate a little bit below that get a little bit above that it's pushing for 14 and then we had a, a couple of bad weeks but uh we're sitting at about 12 percent now okay now unusually in the world of tipping and a lot of people probably say thank goodness looking at some of the other tipsters you have an only fans page right now, how, did, how did that happen uh well the only fans came first to be honest um I wanted to do tipping, but I was like, how do I, how do I come at this a little bit differently? Um, all that people know me for us is for horses. And I have a large, beautiful collection of lingerie that I wanted to share. And I like taking photos and I like sharing um, sexy things. And that's been a whole long journey for myself as well. That came from, I guess, a, a background of, not being confident sexually at all. Um, and that's actually destroyed past relationships because I was very, um, I had a lot of things to work through and I feel like I've come out that other side. And I'm quite sexually confident now and, and happy with who I am. I'm, I'm a little bit curvier than what I perhaps would like to be, but I also hate the gym. So yin and yang. Um, but I wanted to combine the two and thought, why not? We'll give it a crack. And was amazed at how much that took off. It's obviously a little bit of a gimmick appeal to it as well, which is, again, why I chose OnlyFans, because I, I knew it would get people talking. But you didn't do it under Libby Hopwood? No, because I wasn't quite ready for it to go completely viral yet. I just wanted to, to dip my toe. I actually started an OnlyFans a few years ago now, and I posted one photo. It was, again, under an alias. I posted one photo that nobody could see anything. It was just myself and my cello and a really long wig. Um, and I chickened out and didn't touch it again for probably a couple of years. And then I came back to it and I started under an alias so I could work out how I really felt about it, how I could work out how I felt about the interactions that I was having on the page. So my partner and I could just sort of settle into it and see how we felt about it and negotiate where we stood on all the different things. Uh, and then somebody in racing found it I don't know how, uh, and blew it up. So um, we were probably ready for it to to come out at that stage. But yeah, I would have preferred to have really taken it viral on my own accord. But yeah. And you mentioned your partner there. He takes the photos, I uh, I understand. We, and, uh, we, have, 
a funny interaction with one of our clients. I was like, oh, how does, how does he feel about you doing this? I was like, who, who do you think's taking the photos? Like, I'm not doing this in isolation. I did enjoy the life hack where you can fly to Bali and put it on your tax. Right? <laughs> So now all my lingerie and all our travel is tax deductible. So top tip, start an OnlyFans, earn a little bit of money, and then you can claim your you can claim your uh, your travel. All right, fine. Well, everything seems to be flying at the moment, Libby, but is there a next in on, on the horizon for you? Uh I really want to knuckle down and really smash these digital content. So I took that little bit of a break. I want to try to ramp the OnlyFans up and ramp up my commitment to the fans on there. I've just started doing voice memos actually, because I was struggling to keep up with everybody thinks only fans is just posting a few sexy pics and getting paid. It's not that at all. Obviously there's sexy pics on there, but it's the interaction with the fans and it's hours and hours of messaging and talking to people every day. Um, and I was really struggling to keep up with the volume of content with uh, texting so I've started sending voice memos and I'm really enjoying that because I can, I can get through things much faster, but also it's it's quite a bit more personal and I, I feel like I'm, I'm actually talking to people. So hopefully, and the feedback is that they're getting much more out of it too. So I want to up my commitment to my fans, definitely put out more photos. Uh, my photos walk a bit of a line too, because I don't do triple X content and I don't do full nude content, but I do that. I do lewd content. So it's, it's basically implied. I have fully naked photos on there, um, but I've blurred out the, the important bits. So you can't still can't find one of my nipples on the internet, which I'm a little bit excited about. Um, but trying to walk the line between giving enough exciting, sexy content with staying true to myself and staying true to what I want to put out there and also giving their fans what they want. And then with the tipping website, I just got home from Bali and I, I redeveloped that website. I've changed the logo, changed the color theme and fixed out some bugs in the in the website and fixed all that. So that's, I want to ramp that up too, especially coming into spring. I want to start doing content for that. I've got an idea that we're just getting organized for now. I want to do, I'm, uh, I'll keep that under wraps because somebody might beat me to it, but I'm going to be shooting some content for that as well. Uh, and then hopefully that can lead into interviewing people in a podcast such as this and, and things like that, because it's, it's this interaction with people that I love. And this is why I love the only fans. Brilliant. Well, people can find you by Googling you. You're active on Twitter pretty much daily. So active um, on Twitter. there's a link tree on there as well. Cause only fans is terrible for finding your favorite person. It's, it's not a great search engine because they want to give people the right to stay hidden if they want to. Uh, so you pretty much need a link. So if you want to find me across any of those, your best thing is to, to go to Twitter uh, and to go to my link tree or yeah, I'm, I'm very much Googleable. You can Google Libby tips. If you want to find me on only fans, it is foxy.miss. But like I said, a link tree is probably your best result. Twitter, uh, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, you name it, across all the socials. Brilliant. Well, I really do appreciate your time, Libby. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Libby Hopford, thank you very much. Thank you.